Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. James Lyons-Weiler coming to you live from the WWDNYK studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This today, today's show, Unbreaking Science, is a very special episode. We're going to be talking about ivermectin, specifically with Dr. Pierre Corey, um, for the purposes of educating physicians who are interested in learning about the most recent science, the most recent data, the most recent studies. So everything that you've heard about uh, ivermectin to date, um, that is now old news. And what we're going to bring forward today is late-breaking, brand-new stuff. By the time some of you watch this, there's going to be a, a bolus of physician watching this. A week from now, it'll be a week old. But first, I'm going to give Dr. Corey a layup here. As we do... So in the Journal of Antibiotics, something in Tokyo, this is uh, it's generally understood that several studies reported antiviral effects of ivermectin on RNA viruses such as Zika, dengue, yellow fever, West Nile, Hendra, Newcastle, Venezuela, equine encephalitis, chikungunya, semiliki forest, synbis, avian influenza A, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, human immunodeficiency virus type 1 and severe acute respiratory syndrome coronis 2. So there's also in animal studies equine, uh, equine herpes type 1, BK polymer virus, uh, pseudorabies, porcine circovirus, and bovine herpivirus. And the reason why I lay that all out is because what I'm about to do is I'm going to give you the background of the, just called the translational context about what the science that's known right now uh, in, in which physicians are considering, do I try to look at <clears throat> ivermectin? Do I not try to look at ivermectin? And the full story here. So the next thing I want to show you is that the mechanisms of action, uh, there's at least two that are proposed. One is known. Uh, ivermectin inhibits the nuclear import of viral uh, and, and, ho and host proteins. So what we're looking at is uh, a, a molecule that is not a mysterious black box mechanism. That's very important for interpreting whether it should go to market. Uh, it should be licensed uh, or used off label um, in this manner. Now, this is a really stunning uh, letter to the editor um, in this journal. Um, that uh, uh, one one quote that I wanted to say is ivermectin has demonstrated anti-inflammatory effect in vivo and in vitro that works by reducing the production of TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and IL-6. And of course, the NFK, NFK beta translocation. What I wanted to say is most people who follow Unbreaking Science and who've read, read my books and read my scientific literature, they know TNF-alpha, they know IL-1, they know IL-6. These are key mediators. They're, they're intermediate signaling molecules that tell the body to go one way or the other with respect to inflammation. And so we're looking at known mechanisms and, and known consequences on inflammation. It's not a mystery. Uh, however, uh, over the course of this past year, there has been back and forth on translational interpretation of the available data. Uh, here's one by Mike Bray et al. in antiviral research from June, ivermectin and COVID-19. There's an FDA warning, two letters, the editor and author's responses, um, and, and Dr. Pierre Corey will help us that all in context. Uh, there are reports of lack of efficacy at standard doses that, that are recommended for use um, for treatment of parasites with ivermectin. And this lack of e efficacy, however, is then countered by reports of efficacy. Uh, lower mortality. One study had an 88% reduction in mortality. And so the nature of the kinds of studies we're looking at are important in terms of translational context. <coughs> and then this uh, letter to the editor, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, a synergistic combination for COVID-19 chemoprophylaxis and treatment actually says, oops, actually says, um, uh, I forgot to put the quote in there, what it says, but basically if, if no one is looking at the um, synergistic effect of what I want to say about mechanisms is that hydroxychloroquine works by a completely different mechanism than ivermectin, so it's completely expected that there should be uh, some synergistic effect. Safety, of course, is an issue, and that's why we turn to science, not just opinion. What's disappointing about this is there seems to be a rush towards the assumption of 100% go forward on 
certain medical approaches to coronavirus, but other ones, the sliding scale of science is raised artificially. Um, and so, you know, we'll probably get into that a little bit. I want to welcome Dr. Pierre Corey. Thank you for being here. James, my pleasure. Um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, use any opportunity to talk about ivermectin in this pandemic. All right. So I have to ask you, um, um, did you send me your slides? I didn't. I have them here. Can I share a screen or, or do no, I have to there's no to sharing you? screen from where you are. So if you shoot those to me quick, I'll load them up into our software. How do here. I, um, how do I uh, advance the slides? I'll advance them when you say next slide. That'll be oh, fun. really? I hate that, James. <laughs> I hate that. I should have given you You're a warning. You're literally going to make me do that? I am. I'm sorry about that. But oh, in the meantime, no! in the meantime, you could just give us a narration as you're thinking of sending me a, uh, the PowerPoints. Uh, let okay. me ask you, how did you, let's just chat first. How did you get into uh, ivermectin? What drew your interest to it? Yeah, so I'm going to definitely have to give credit to Dr. Paul Marek. So, you know, the, the organization that I'm a part of, which is the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, um, uh, we, we were formed uh, in early March because some doctors reached out to Paul, who's, you know, the, one of the most famous intensivists in the world. That's what I am. I'm an ICU and a lung specialist. Um, and they reached out to him and said, you know, you've got to protocol for treating this and so he gathered his closest friends and colleagues of which I'm really honored to be one of them uh, and we formed a group of five uh, expert critical care uh, docs and uh, you know the five of us I think we number almost 2,000 publications among us um, Dr. Umberto Maduri is like one of the pioneers of critical care I mean he's a, a father of non-invasive ventilation corticosteroids and critical illness and ARDS um, Dr. Marek's work in sepsis is unparalleled um, and so I, I, I'm honored to be part of this group and and that's all we've done is we've tried to come up with the most effective uh, treatment for this and our math plus protocol which is for hospitalized patients we came up with that in early April and that included corticosteroids at a time when the entire world was against it. Um, and we got a lot of flack for that until we were proven correct. Um, yeah. Like I told you, I gave Senate testimony on the critical need for, uh, for corticosteroids in early May and got a lot of attacks for that, but uh, we, we were proven right. Um, and then ivermectin, you know, we've been reviewing data, pathophysiology, therapeutics, trials, everything, the entire time. That's all we do is read papers. Yep. And we always had ivermectin on the list with a question mark. You know, it had a rationale, but it really didn't have clinical trials evidence. And I got to tell you, it was Paul Marek. We were doing a review in October of like all those negative trials that came out of solidarity, which basically, you know, stuck a fork in the, you know, in, in a number of therapeutics that were being used. Um, and he was looking at what's, late, what's the latest with ivermectin, and he saw a few trials that really caught our attention. And so he was the first one on that data signal. He gave a lecture, put it on his YouTube channel. He and I are chatting. I started following his uh, footsteps, and I start reading and reading. And I am just, my eyes are popping on every trial that I'm seeing, and, and the rest is here. I've immersed myself in ivermectin. Uh, I've been at this, I don't know, two and a half months, um, 20 hours a day, and... Um, I don't know. I guess I'm the world expert now, or one of them in in uh, on ivermectin and COVID nineteen. Well, for the fifteen twenty minutes that I've actually bothered to read the abstracts and titles and so on of the papers, it seems that in the in the actual outlay of the balance of the science, it is not a settled question that it's useless. There's nobody out there saying ivermectin is useless, right? So as I understand it, and remember to load up your slides for me in the email. Um, uh, I be, sent them to you. I don't. I, hopefully, they went. Unless yeah, okay. it's too big, okay. it should yeah. have gone. Okay. So my yeah, understand. My understanding is, yeah, there they are. So my understanding is that nobody's saying that it's useless. There are some questions about dosing, and as the consummate scientist and objective researcher that you are, the objective medical physician that you are. Okay. So uh, when somebody says, "Well, there's questions about the dosing," um, and yet there's uh, some studies show. Hey, it's not effective at late stage. These people are on ventilators, but hey, look, it's uh, actually maybe effective early on. Your answer is fine. I'll do more science, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we'll, I'll take any data <laughs> that anyone can bring. I mean, that's all we do. We vacuum up data and we we use it and apply it. And that's that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to share that data that we've compiled. <clears throat> okay, that's awesome. So you're currently located where, so people have a context. So I uh, live in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a New Yorker. Uh, um, originally, I left New York about five years ago. 
I was recruited by the University of Wisconsin. Um, I, I left there. I kind of I, I like to say that I jumped out of the ivory tower earlier in COVID. Um, just um, yeah, just conflicts on how to treat this and how to lead the team. And I, so I went back to New York, actually. I did uh, five weeks uh, running the ICU during their sort of deluge uh, at Beth Israel uh, Medical Center in lower Manhattan. That's where I practiced for uh, over a decade. Uh, and so I was back in New York, and then I've traveled uh, doing locums, ICU work, running ICUs in different hotspots, Greenville, South Carolina. And then I joined a, a, a group, um, a big medical center in Milwaukee, uh, which I also just recently left. I'm going to go back out and do locums again. Right on. So I watched your testimony. I have to say it really took a lot of guts for you to get up there and tell it like it is. You know, th this is what these hearings are for. They're for perspective. And medicine is, uh, practice in medicine, as you well know, but some people, you know, might not understand that, that there's a consensus of standard of care. There is no standard of care for prophylaxis of COVID-19. There is no standard of care for early treatment. And that, that this is a still a very open and active question. And so I'm honored that you just, that you agreed to come onto Unbreaking Science and share the good news that you have uh, about a, a new publication and so on that's, that's coming. So listen, if you're listening to this on social media, this is going to be an academic presentation. We're not going to take their time to define all of the terms. We're going to assume as much as possible that people will do the background knowledge or have some kind of a, a, a scientific medical background because this specific presentation is for physicians around the world. Okay, so we're up and here we go. All right, so again, uh, happy to be here and uh, what I want to do today is <clears throat> review the clinical trials evidence, uh, actually other, other forms of evidence as well, uh, demonstrating the efficacy of ivermectin, uh, both in the prevention and treatment of COVID-19. So um, next slide, if you could, James. Um, so um, I, w I have to move my head. I'm, I'm sorry. So James, can I just interrupt for one quick second? Sure. My uh, my little window where I see myself it's too small. Yeah. Is well, it's over the slide. Hmm. So I, I like how, I can't see. I, I can't. Can, can see you can you bring up the slides on your screen? Oh, you know what? PowerPoint. I made it full screen. I made it full screen, and now it's better. Okay. Okay. Good. Oh, can you get rid of this slide? Sorry, that's a uh, that was a, a note to me. I'm sorry sure. about this. Maybe we that's can right. edit this out later. Um, yep. Anyway, so yeah, so let's let's go over the emerging evidence. Um, uh, quite quite a bit of it's actually gone through peer review. A lot of it's from preprint servers, uh, but the data is unmistakable, and I want to go through those. Um, next slide. So first off, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, no conflicts of interest. Uh, this talk is essentially uh, informed by my uh, review manuscript that I wrote with with the group of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance. Uh, Dr. Paul Marrick's the senior author. I'm the first author, and I'm really proud to uh, announce that uh, we went through a fairly rigorous peer review process, and we just uh, we just got accepted. And so we anticipate publication. It's actually in a pretty well-regarded journal called the Frontiers in Pharmacology. Um, and I think it's going to be up uh, and posted, published online within hopefully a week to 10 days. Um, and it's in a special issue called uh, The Use of Available Drugs in COVID-19. Um, next slide. And so this is uh, the FLCCC Alliance with Dr. Merrick. I'm sure, I'm sure many people know uh, Dr. Merrick, one of the most famous uh, clinicians and the second most highly published intensivist in the world. And so uh, that was our group uh, of, of intensivists that, that came together with uh, Dr. Maduri, Dr. Verone, and Dr. Iglesias, and then some of our supporters and advisors. Um, and so let's talk about ivermectin. I'm going to be brief in introducing it. Uh, many people know it, uh, as they should, is, is that it's an anti-parasite drug. And um, it, it has already had a historic and global impact on public health in the world. Uh, and that's why its discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize, because ever since it was invented and used uh, for the eradication of a number of parasitic infections that were endemic in multiple countries and continents, um, it essentially transformed the health, uh, the, the, the health status of millions and millions of people. Um, we've been using it almost 40 years. We've given it 3.7 billion times. It has one of the most unparalleled safety profiles. Um, and it's now on the WHO's list of essential medicines. And so it's already an extremely well-known drug with, uh, with a historic impact in public health. Um, next slide. 
So um, as you actually introduced already, James, is that it's been shown in the lab to have uh, antiviral activity against a number of, our, of, of uh, viruses, uh, typically RNA viruses. And so um, that's already something that was suspected, right? And then what happened was, next slide, um, Dr. Um, you know, we have a number of antiviral mechanisms that have been identified. And I'll talk about the Wagstaff or the Cayley study from Australia in a second, but th these are what uh, the papers right now are defining. Is that what, this is in top to bottom what we think are probably the most uh, prominent mechanisms. And that number one, it's been showing to bind tightly to the spike protein. And we believe that's what's, what it's doing is it's disrupting the binding with the ACE2 receptor and preventing entry into the cell. That's why we think this thing is so potent at preventing transmission. If you take ivermectin, you don't appear to fall ill. The other thing is for those who are sick, especially early on, it seems to really interrupt viral replication through a number of mechanisms interfering with, you know, the uh, the production of essential structural and non-structural proteins, as well as interfering with RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Now, this important mediated entry, if you go to the next slide, um, that's the one where I think, um, you know, we got uh, we got sidelined or sort of uh, we, we went down a side street is that, you know, there was this study came out in April from Australia at Monash University where they they used a cell culture model. It was monkey kidney cells. And they showed this this the near eradication of viral uh, presence in the cell. Um, at 48 hours after they uh, used ivermectin in the cell coach model. Now, they used a very high dose of ivermectin, and so everybody dismissed the import, at least the scientists did, um, thinking that you could never achieve these doses. And so many people have put down ivermectin as being not really, um, you know, as not being effective because in order to hit the doses that they used in this uh, trial, you would need 100-fold uh, the standard dose. So if you go to the next slide, um, but that's simply not true. So I went over the other uh, mechanisms of, of uh, antiviral properties. It's not probably the least important is probably the, the important blocking into the nucleus. And the other thing is that was a monkey kidney culture. So first of all, cell cultures are not the same as humans. We are not just a cell culture, right? We have an intact immune system. The other thing is ivermectin accumulates in different tissues differently. So in the lungs, three to 10 times the serum levels and in visceral fat where most of the ACE2 receptors are even higher. And so you can get much higher concentrations in human lung cells. And Dr. Wagstaff actually repeated her studies with alveolar cells and she's showing that. And so that's not published yet, um, but we've, we've spoken with her. And, and so that this, this concern over the inability to achieve dosing is simply wrong. It's incorrect. And it also, uh, it also ignores all the clinical trials that I'm gonna present. So next slide. Um, the <clears throat> The pharmacology, right, it's actually highly lipophilic. It has a long half-life. Uh, and so dose, and then especially the sequestration of the drug, especially in, in the lung, in fact, uh, in GOAT studies, they show up to 17 days later, you can find uh, uh, meta, you know, ivermectin in the lung. Um, next slide. And, and just going back to this, this dosing, right? So the standard dose is 200 micrograms per kilogram or 0 0.2 milligrams, right? And if you take one dose on a fasted stomach, T max is about, you reach about 60 micrograms per ml in the blood. If it's with a meal, it's like two to three times that. Uh, and same thing with the lung. You'll see two to three times the concentration in lung tissue um, after a meal. And so the IC50, what we're seeing from Dr. Wagstaff for alveolar cells is actually about 105 micrograms per gram. And so if you look at that, uh, you know, you can easily achieve those, that IC50 with a standard dose. Okay. So next slide. Um, you know, I'm going to just quickly summarize the evidence base that I'm going to take you through, right? I'm not going to take you through trial by trial, although I'll mention the select ones, but I want everyone to understand the totality of the evidence. So as of the publication of my manuscript, of the acceptance two days ago, I, I, I discuss and I introduce in that manuscript 27 controlled trials. The number of patients in those trials is over 6,500. The, uh, I think I lost my slides. Where did that go? Um, can you go back? Uh, um, I have to find my... Yeah, oh, there I guess. Um, so, um, so six, and here's the thing is everyone says they're not randomized. That's not true. 16 of the 27 are randomized controlled trials, and that, those alone have over 2,500 patients, and five of them are double-blind, one or single-blind. 
11 are observational controlled trials with reasonably matched comparison groups in almost all circumstances, a few that aren't, um, but you have to be careful when you read these studies. And 11 of the 27 have been published in peer-reviewed journals, right? Um, and I want the world to know that the WHO, and we think in the wake of our manuscript that hit a preprint server in uh, late October, early November, the WHO uh, has a consultant who's doing a systematic review and meta-analysis, only looking at randomized controlled trials and only in the treatment, so not the prevention. <clears throat> and he has now contacted, he is in communication with 59 principal investigators around the world who have a, a randomized controlled trial of ivermectin in COVID-19. As of today, he has results from 18 of them. And he's in, in, in his meta-analysis, the preliminary one, which is going to be posted on a preprint server in the next week, because we're in collaboration and discussion with him frequently, um, he's actually over 2,100 studies. Now, he has results from some unpublished, unposted trials. That's why that result uh, there is higher than what I had in my manuscript. But the WHO is well ahead of us. Um, at least on the treatment uh, studies, and they are doing a, a meta-analysis. And he anticipates that once he gets the results from a few more trials coming out in the next few weeks, and the total includes over 3,000 patients, he expects that will be enough for the WHO to review and come up with a recommendation. So next slide. So these are the trials and where they're from. Uh, there are three trials in the U.S., oddly, uh, and I don't know why this is, but out of all of the investigators around the world who've, con who've communicated and responded to him that he's in contact with, he has not been able to establish contact with the three trialists in the USA. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to report that as a fact, and I don't know why that is. Um, but this is where the trials are coming from and the numbers of patients in those trials. Next slide. Um, so here, I'm just going to, so if you look at my manuscript, this is a table from my manuscript where I basically just list Every trial, what they showed, what a little description of the design and the dose, and whether they're randomized or observational. And this was the section of the table which just describes prophylaxis trials. And I am, this is, in my opinion, this is the strongest data, is in prevention of transmission. Three randomized controlled trials with over 700 patients, and then five, uh, some of them large observational controlled trials with over 2,000 patients. And what they show is essentially, for instance, one model is where they take people who have a household member who just tested positive and they immediately randomize the households to those who get ivermectin and those that don't. And you'll see dramatic reduction. So on that first trial, 58% of the household members who did not get ivermectin got COVID versus 7% if you did. Now remember, this is post-exposure prophylaxis. By the time they got the ivermectin to these uh, family members, they'd already been around someone, so you can't perfectly eradicate it, but they did a remarkable job. In a similar study below, 2% versus 10%, every trial you see here is significantly, statistically significantly positive with large reductions. Here's one and another one in Argentina, 21% down to 3%. And then these two by, uh, this one by Carvalho is probably, actually this one here, uh, the sixth one down, is probably the, the most dramatic where he actually dosed uh, healthcare workers weekly for uh, up to 10 weeks. And over that 10 week period out of 788 healthcare workers, nobody got ill. In the 407 controls, 58% contracted COVID-19. I mean, a wickedly positive result. And, and even the observational trials and randomized control trials are similar. If you go to the next slide, um, uh, and actually the one of the trials there that I didn't mention was a really kind of an interesting uh, trial because it, it relates to nursing home, right? So there was a nursing home in France where they had a scabies outbreak. And when that happens in a nursing home, they put all healthcare workers as well as the residents on ivermectin and the, the operators noticed that in that one nursing home back in March and April, almost nobody was getting COVID. And in the surrounding nursing homes in the region, in the area, they were getting wickedly high rates as well as deaths and nobody died in that one nursing home. And so that was sort of an interesting kind wow. of observation study. And, and so, I mean, the studies are just uh, incredible to read and see, see the impacts of this. And so, you know, what do you do when you have small studies? You do a meta-analysis, right? And so if you look at this meta-analysis, at the top of the observational trials, at the bottom of the randomized controlled trials, and you're seeing this, uh, this w unbelievably low odds ratio of getting COVID if you take ivermectin, either as post-exposure or pre-exposure. And so the studies are lining up sizes, centers, designs. They line up. Next slide. Um, so that was the prophylaxis trials. Now, if you go back one slide, 
if you and start looking at um, the sort of what I call moderate illness trials, many of these are either mild to moderate illness, some of them hospitalized, um, but here's a whole collection, a number of them are randomized. So if you look, the first four are double blind randomized controlled trials. And some of the smaller ones might not find a statistically significant benefit, although some do, but all the larger ones did, especially in terms of either mortality or deterioration need for the hospitalization, statistically significant reductions in those endpoints in the double blind, larger randomized controlled trials. Some of the case series are equally compelling. So a group in the Dominican Republic who've basically been saying throughout the pandemic that they don't have a problem treating COVID, nobody believes them, but in that group, they treated 3,000 consecutive patients who arrived in the emergency room with ivermectin. They found 16 patients needed the hospital out of 3,000 consecutive and only one death. Too good to be true, maybe, but this is the data that we're seeing. Next slide. Um, this is actually from uh, Dr. Andrew Hill, the WHO consultant who shared this data. And by the way, he actually invited him He's the one uh, that I presented with to the NIH two weeks ago. We presented these data to the NIH, and this was his slide, because he has much more granular data than we're able to get, because he's in contact with the investigators. So um, his data is really interesting. This is just trials of single-day dosing, so one-dose uh, trials. And it's showing a trend, and some of them quite significant, this viral load in the point, so the time to being undetectable or PCR negative you're seeing statistically shorter durations until you're negative. But that's the one-day dosing trials. Go to the next slide. This is what you see on the two-day dosing trials. Every single one statistically significant with large magnitude benefits. Multi-day dosing, time to being undetectable at PCR. Again, showing really important impacts and application to transmission of this disease. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> now, I gave you sort of the prevention and early, um, uh, early outpatient, but here's the thing. If you know anything about COVID, COVID is actually not a viral disease in the hospital. You don't get culturable virus in almost anyone after about five days from first symptoms. Most of the transmissions and viral replications happening pre-symptomatic or early symptomatic. By the time you get to the hospital, you're actually suffering from a host response, right? And so that's why many hospitalized patients, you can't even, some of them, you don't even find the virus. They're negative, but we know they have COVID. And it, it appears to be this dramatic host inflammatory response to actually the non-viable RNA fragments. It's the actually RNA that we think is making everybody sick. And so why would ivermectin work in the hospital if it's such a potent antiviral what is its properties that make it effective in the hospital? And it's clearly, like you mentioned, James, it is profound anti-inflammatory properties. So if you look at the next slide, um, here uh, it seems to have, and again, I review this in a section in my paper, but there's a growing list of studies showing these important anti-inflammatory mechanisms, some of which you mentioned. And one of them is probably its impacts on uh, NF-kappa-beta, which is one of the most potent mediators of inflammation. We also have studies on how it reduces cytokine production after lipopolysaccharide exposure, which is more of a bacterial uh, sepsis model. Um, but it seems to be a really potent anti-inflammatory. So next slide. Um, and this is just a couple of slides showing that when you're treating with ivermectin at escalating doses, you're seeing a reduction in the cytokines levels um, after exposure to lipopolysaccharide. Uh, next slide. Um, and then uh, similarly here, <laughs> it's unbelievable. If you treat with ivermectin, so the black bar is control, and then the one right next to it is when you treat with ivermectin, I mean, you're seeing this profound different response to lipopolysaccharide uh, and survival. It's, it's, it's truly incredible. Um, so next slide. So it seems to be working as an anti-inflammatory agent. Here's where you have even more profound impacts. Hospitalized patients. In my manuscript, six RCTs, almost a thousand patients in them, and then the observational control trials, some of which are quite well done. The one that was published in CHESS by Dr. Ryder in Florida, 280 patients, showed a dramatic reduction in mortality, and he had 280 patients in that. And it was a propensity match study, which is actually quite a valid study design, approximates the strength of a randomized control trial. But even without that, the randomized control trial are showing repeated large statistically significant reductions in mortality, as well as length of stay and time to clinical recovery. It's truly, truly a remarkable uh, drug in the COVID-19. Um, again, you can review my manuscript and I go over these in a little bit more detail there. Next slide. 
So again, meta-analysis. Look at this meta-analysis. If anyone studies clinical drugs or intervention, you don't see this kind of uh, forest plot. You just don't see it. Everything's lining up. And you hear, you hear you even have the collection of RCTs more powerful than the observational control trials. And so you're seeing this rep reproducible, consistently positive, strong impact on this is just time to clinical recovery. This is just time to clinical recovery. Go to the next slide where I do mortality. Here is mortality, similar. In fact, I think I didn't have the right slide, but this is the mortality uh, one, and you're showing this dramatic impact in mortality, huge reduction in the odds of dying when you get ivermectin in the hospital. Next slide. And so that's just the clinical trials evidence. And then I want to go through some of the most compelling, and it's this, uh, this amount of evidence that I'm going to go through, which actually is what sort of tipped me over and became, I became ivermectin obsessed. Um, I came across a paper by a man named Juan Chimie, who's a data analyst. He's actually a business data analyst from Colombia. And he heard early on that from some friends of his, I think it was in Colombia, some region of Colombia, that they were taking ivermectin and nobody was getting sick. And that was really effective. So he heard it like word of mouth. And he started watching the data. And so he's an expert on what's happening in South America. And I'm going to go over his work and what his analyses have showed. Other people have done similar work. So Alan Cannell... He lives in Brazil. He's a British engineer. He's lived there for many, many years. And he actually started seeing, started measuring impacts on case counts and deaths in cities that initiated ivermectin distribution. And then Trial Site News is this incredible site where they post all sorts of updated findings and trials and commentary. I've learned a ton, and I was able to get to a lot of data through him. And then obviously, Paul, for getting us to pay attention to ivermectin. So uh, this data is really incredible. Let's go to the next slide. Um, it's all visual and, and it's really reproducible and dramatic. So this was the first thing that sort of tipped me off, which I was really uh, just shocked by. So Juan Chimie, he he noticed that a number of regional health ministries in different states in Peru were, were initiating ivermectin distribution campaigns. And he, he was able to time the initiation of those campaigns. And if you look, the shaded areas on each graph is the time before ivermectin was distributed. And very tight temporal associations after ivermectin distribution. And by the way, this is all only in patients older than 60. So this is not confounded by an increase in cases or uh, of, of young people. So it's not confounded by young people. This is in over 60. So before ivermectin, your chance of dying from this disease was absurdly high. After ivermectin, the case fatality rates plummeted and it was all tightly temporarily associated. If you look, the timings in the states are different and each of the each of the, the distribution campaigns correspond with the peak in infections and then a reduction. Go to the next slide. This is where he calculates the case fatality rate. So again, shaded areas before and then there's the areas after. And you look, your chance of dying if you're over 60 from COVID back in April and May was around 50%. And that started to plummet. And now if you're over 60 in Peru, Peru, your chance of dying is single digits. The case fatality rates have plummeted. Next slide. <clears throat> this is um, this was later on. So those, if you look at all those states and those distribution campaigns, that was earlier. Many of them were like in uh, 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 May, June. Then they started, a group started this thing called Mega Oper Operacion Taita. And they targeted the elderly and most risk challenge. This is prophylaxis. They distributed ivermectin to the oldest and the highest risk patients in these yeah, states. And if you look at those bars, you will see, you will this see the is, same uh, pattern developing. So, those, if you look um, so uh, again, corresponding to drastic, drastic reduction in death and case counts. Next slide. Um, and, and on our website, we have a section which actually details all of this. It's a really cool page to go through. But this was the same, uh, similar data to the first couple of slides in that the blue lines and the blue shaded areas respond, uh, are the, co correspond to those eight states with ivermectin distribution. The background, which is red, which is the largest city, which was Lima, they did not start using ivermectin until recently. And you'll see they did not have the same drastic dr uh, drops as well as sustained reductions. They had lots of spikes and very high case counts and deaths, and they did not use ivermectin. So it's again, it's almost a natural experiment with a control group. Next slide.
And I could keep doing this all day. This is Alan Cannell's work in Brazil. He noticed that these three renegade cities that decided to distribute ivermectin to their population, you, you, say, you saw in those regions compared to neighboring cities of similar sizes, you saw drastic reductions in case fatality rates and case counts. So that's one, uh, that's one uh, piece of data. Again, the highlighted one are the cities that distributed. The one next to it is the same region, neighboring city, and you see a totally discordant drop in case counts and fatality rates after the ivermectin. Next slide. Um, this is the same data which shows mortality. Again, you see much bigger drops here uh, than in the corresponding regions. Next slide. And so that was Peru, multiple states in Peru, Operation uh, Taita, that, the next one was Brazil, and Uttar Pradesh, a state of 210 million people. I think it makes it something like the 10th biggest country in the world, just one state in northern India. They began distributing two months ago to all of the citizen households, ivermectin, a, a treatment pack which included ivermectin. Their case counts have skyrocketed down. And in fact, I think it was a week ago, they had one day without a death in a state of 210 million people. It is winning in India. In fact, there was another article I read a week ago. There are many hospitals in India which is trying to send back remdesivir and monoclonal antibodies because they don't need them. They bought too much and it's not necessary. Next slide. This was Paraguay. It's another interesting story. If you look at that blue line, that was a state called Alto Paraña. And the governor there got sick with COVID and him and his brother. They were obese. They were diabetic. They got ivermectin. They felt better quickly. So it convinced them that it was working. Now, I'm not saying that's how we usually figure out how the medicine works, but this governor was so convinced of his, uh, of his response to it that he immediately initiated a deworming campaign. He called it a deworming campaign to not get in trouble with the federal government, and he distributed throughout his state. Six weeks later, he didn't have a case in the hospital, and he claimed that it eradicated COVID in his state. And if you look at compared to the other states, it's markedly different. Next slide. Um, so we did Paraguay, we did Peru, we did Brazil, we did India. In Mexico, only one state has used ivermectin. It's the state of Chiapas, one of the biggest states down in southern Mexico. And if you look to the left, that's before August. That was the cases per 100,000 people, 604. And then after August, it plummeted down to 240. If you look at the other states, many of them went up. Nobody had a reduction like that. Next slide. And then if you look, uh, similarly, the deaths plummeted. So 28 per 100,000 before, down to four. Nobody else in Mexico has single-digit case fatality rates like that. Next slide. Um, and this is where visually it's just dramatic. If you look at all of those other states in Mexico and how they've done, and then the big green line, which is Chiapas, which has this sustained and very low case fatality rate, lower than anywhere else in Mexico and probably the world. Next slide. This is similar visually. Look at Chapas and how well it's done against COVID. I mean, this is just overwhelming and profound. It's over and over and over we're seeing these. Next slide. Um, so, and I'm just done. I could do this all day, but this is a similar thing that happened in, in, in two cities in in, um, uh, in Brazil, Belém and Fortaleza, when they started distributing ivermectin. You saw even on the Fortaleza, even when the case counts increased, if you look at cases above and deaths below, even when they had spikes in case counts, the deaths did not correspond to go up in either place. So death rates were decreasing. Next slide. So um, keep going, next slide. We're getting a little, uh, yeah. So um, why isn't everyone using it? So these are some of the criticisms and I'm gonna go through it in a little bit more detail. And, and most of it is just wrong. The criticism is just flat out wrong. So I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but I've been told that the majority of studies are observational uncontrolled trials, totally false. My manuscript has 27 controlled trials, 16 of them are randomized controlled trials. The majority of the studies have not been published in peer-reviewed journals. Also false, at the time it was 12 of the 24, now I think it's actually 11 of the 27 are in peer review. So quite a number have, and I'd like to remind everyone that every therapeutic adopted in COVID-19 did so from pre-print data. Cor remdesivir, corticosteroids, monoclonal antibodies, and convalescent plasma, okay? Um, now, that hasn't worked out that great. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, but to hold ivermectin to somehow some new different standard than what we've adopted. And I also want to point out that we started using vaccines before even a pre-print manuscript was available. People stuck their arms out 
for vaccines before a wider review by the Physician Society. It was all done by government experts. And then the other thing which I've heard, which gets me nothing less than furious, is this idea that the majority of the trials were performed abroad and are not generalizable to our patients. I've been told that by a therapeutics committee. That's literally what they said. So they're basically saying that an antiviral, an anti-inflammatory agent works in black and brown people, but not in Americans. That is absurd and offensive. And then again, the majority were not randomized. That's not true. If you go to the next slide. So with these data, some of you know, I went uh, in the Senate testimony, I was invited, uh, and I basically called a call to action asking the NIH to review the data and come up with an upgraded recommendation. Because what you don't know, or may not remember, but on August 27th, the NIH uniquely in any therapeutic that we've used in this pandemic, the ivermectin is the only one that had an against rating. They had a degree of strong recommendation, expert opinion only against use outside of clinical trials. I have not gotten a satisfying answer for them as to how that happened. How could they be so strong against its use and only be expert opinion? And so mm -hmm. after our meeting, I was, in, I was finally invited to the NIH. I, pre I presented the data along with my colleague, Dr. Marek, as well as the expert consultant for the WHO. We, we presented two weeks ago. And two days ago, the NIH has now upgraded their recommendation. Next slide. And this is what they upgraded it to. I find this both unsatisfying and supremely satisfying and mostly just unsurprising. This is now what they say for ivermectin, that they've determined that there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against. However, you have to know something. This is a change from recommend against, so they did move it. So I would say they're considering it now an option. They just don't have enough data to come up with a firm recommendation. Fine at least put it out there as an option for doctors to use. And by the way, this strength of recommendation is the same recommendation for convalescent plasma and monoclonal antibodies, which are ubiquitously and widely used. And so for someone to tell me that they can't use ivermectin based, based on this, go look at the NIH guidelines for those two other therapies. Next slide. Um, this is some of the comments in their new updated page. So they say some clinical studies showed no benefits or worsening of disease. True, it was the tiny little studies that showed no benefits, and their only one that showed worsening, and it wasn't even worsening, is a terribly designed trial. It's a pharmacolo pharmacologic database analysis study where they were not able to control for severity illness. And when you look at the graphs, all of the treatment groups had a huge increase in deaths on day two of their analysis. Guess why? Dying people get more medicines. And so it's, it's ludicrous to, su to suggest that you get worse after ivermectin. Absolutely ludicrous. But they do other mention that the majority show shorter time resolution of disease, greater reduction in inflammatory markers, shorter time to viral clearance, or lower mortality rates. It sounds like a really good story here, guys. I mean, they are essentially describing the consistent reproducible outcomes of long, many studies that we presented. And then the next slide. So... Um, I want to go over their limitations. So they also listed a, lim uh, a set of limitations on that page, and I also find some of them ludicrous. So number one, they point out the sample size of most of the trials was small. Number one, what is small? I know what small is the way they mean it. They mean it's not a 3,000 patient, double-blind, multi-center randomized controlled trial. Not a surprise. To point that out is ridiculous. We know if that was the case, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Big Pharma or the NIH would have funded that. They have not. In fact, that is a huge absence of a repurposed drug that they have not investigated. And so to blame the fact that we're relying on a whole bunch of small studies is absurd, number one. Number two, the highest level of medical evidence is actually the meta-analysis of randomized controlled trial. It is stronger than any single trial. When you have a number of small randomized controlled trials, you do a meta-analysis of them. That's what the WHO is doing, and the findings are dramatically and consistently positive across those 18 RCTs. That is what we presented. And the other thing is, fine, it's not small in terms of the thousands, but I've generally been taught that when you're looking at an endpoint such as mortality, you generally need a trial of at least 100 patients. And if you look at the RCTs, over 100 patients in our data set, in my manuscript, seven of them are over 100 patients and four of them were double blind. And if you consider RCTs over 50, there's 11 of them. So uh, they're not tiny. They might be smaller than you'd like, but they are what they are. And the sum of the data is, is unmistakable. Next slide. 
the next limitation, which this, I almost have to laugh. Various doses and schedules of ivermectin were used as if this is a limitation. Are you kidding me? This is a strength. It allows us to understand the dose response. It allows us to detect that multi-day dose is actually better than single day. If we only had trials where they did a single day, we would be very unsatisfied and the results would be really uh, incomplete. So we actually have based our treatment protocols, we've evolved them based on the data that we can see from different dosing strategies. I'll give you the best example of why having a single dose and strategy is harmful because of the recovery trial, which essentially transformed the care of COVID overnight with the use of corticosteroids. But you know what it did it with? With the most anemic regimen I've ever heard of. Six milligrams of dexamethasone for fulminant disease and advanced respiratory failure in the ICU, you're giving six milligrams of dexamethasone. I give my elderly COPD patients more corticosteroids than that. And so I, what I find that recovery trial, although it transformed the care, and I think it's a miracle, I mean, I think it, 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 it was a historic impact. I'm very unsatisfied with the regimen they use, and I feel it helps the few but fails the many. And I'll tell you why that is. If you go to the next slide, I wrote a paper starting in April. It took me six journals to get published, but I basically pointed out, tried to point out to the world that COVID-19 is not a viral pneumonia. It's just not a viral pneumonia. You're not finding cytopathic changes on, the, on autopsy in the vast majority of cases. It's what's called an organizing pneumonia, which is not infectious. It's a response or exposure to something that injures the lung. And so it's an inflammatory response. And the primary treatment of organizing pneumonia is corticosteroids. And that is what we point out. And my co-author is one of the top chest radiologists in the world. And their expert panel, which reviewed all the CAT scans from Wuhan back in March, their expert panel in the journal Radiology reported that the prim primary form of lung injury in SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, respiratory disease is organizing pneumonia. That means it's a steroid response of disease. This is only one of the reasons why we knew steroids work. So next slide. Um, and so uh, the other limitations, some of the RCTs were open label in which neither the participants nor the investigators were blinded. And that is true when you're looking at subjective endpoints. So for time to clinical recovery, yes, you're going to have some biases there on both sides. But when you're looking at end objective endpoints, much less concern to no concern. When you're looking at time to viral load, I mean, time to PCR negativity, I'm sorry, but <laughs> knowing what trial arm you're in makes no difference. It's, that's an objective endpoint. Things like death, viral clearance, and viral load. Further, they complain, and this is so unfair, in addition to ivermectin or the comparative drug, patients also receive various concomitant medications. Are you kidding me? Have they, have they met the COVID-19 pandemic? Everybody is on a whole host of medicines and different protocols all over the country. It's almost impossible to, con to, to control for, for different uh, medicines. I'll tell you, I would be bothered by that if I knew that any of those medicines were effective. We know that they don't. Corticosteroids are generally well matched. And so although other things were used amongst the trials, in any individual trial, it actually was added to the standard of care, whatever that standard of care was. And it's only in one or two trials where it was either uh, paired with doxycycline. And by the way, we don't have any evidence that, doxy that doxycycline does anything in addition to ivermectin. The, the ones where ivermectin solo or paired seem to have the same results. And then further, there was only one study where hydroxychloroquine was in the control group. And boy, was that a profoundly positive study in, in terms of ivermectin. Um, and then the severity is not always described. Just leave me alone with these limitations. It, I mean, they're, they're really trying to either save themselves or they're just practicing just incredible bias against this evidence base. But this doesn't matter. We have trials from all stages of disease, prophylactic, early and late, and they're all positive. So I don't really care what the severity was. And they were generally randomized or controlled. Um, and then the final is, again, this study outcome measure is not always well defined. I think that's important when you're talking about the subjective ones like clinical recovery, but there were many objective endpoints. And so last slide, I think I'm almost done, um, is, is so you know what their recommendation is now. It's neither for or against in the treatment. I will also point out that they seem to have ignored or making no plans to update this. Again, I feel the evidence base for prophylaxis is the most profound and the most consistent and reproducible. This is their last opinion on agents in the prevention and prophylaxis. It gives me chest pain to read it. 
The COVID-19 treatment guidelines panel recommends against the use of any agents for SARS-CoV-2 pre-exposure prophylaxis and or post-exposure. Do not use anything to protect yourself from getting this. When are they going to upgrade this based on the prophylaxis trials? This is really, really tough to take right here. Next slide. And notice they don't recommend anything. If you look at our protocols, we have vitamin C, vitamin D, melatonin, quercetin. We know that Dr. Fauci himself takes vitamin C and D to keep his immune system healthy. But yet the NIH can't seem to recommend that because they're waiting for their ubiquitous, pervasive, multi-center double. You can't do anything in medicine without that stupid trial to tell you what to do. You can't doctor anymore. Well, here's Dr. Fauci doctoring himself. Next slide. And so my conclusion, and this is my opinion in reviewing this data, and I've studied many interventions in medicines throughout my career, but I've never seen such consistency and large magnitude of benefits amongst the trials. All of these trials, none of the trialists knew each other. They're from different centers, designs, countries around the world, and they're all reproducibly part of, I've never seen something like that. This to me makes me think of what it would be like if we discovered penicillin against bacterial infections. This is probably what it would look like. But you know what? In the 1940s or 30s, when they discovered the penicillin was active, they didn't do RCTs. They just used it. But now, now that we're in the 2020, uh, we can't do that anymore. We need randomized controlled trials to tell us that something works, and I'm disgusted. Um, and so I've never seen a database that, like this. And that's even discounting the epidemiologic analyses by Juan Chimia and others showing essentially the results of natural experiments, which would be, to me, the highest form of medical evidence. And so uh, with that, I'm going to conclude um, uh, my, uh, my talk. And uh, I think no one's confused about what I feel about ivermectin and COVID-19. Okay, so thank you for that. That was amazing. So this this mountain of evidence. There's mountain. nothing but a mountain of evidence. There's overwhelming evidence. All right, from different populations. That's a strength. The different doses. Day one, day two. Uh, okay, different outcomes on all measures. It appears to be beneficial. Uh, all of the evidence is pointing to that. And let's remember, folks, that this is actually just for an emergency youth authorization. This is not, right? I mean, it, it makes sense that the FDA would go, yeah, okay, this, let, let's do this. Let's do this right now, today, like yesterday, right? And, and so the off-label use, it's already out there for other things. So uh, doc, what I want to say is independent of um, your conclusion, in, or I guess in, in, in addition to this, Right now, we have thousands of people that have that have captured this video already on social media. Thousands of people means every fifty, every every fifty state. We have representatives from all fifty states watching this video right now. I need everybody who watches this to get on the horn to your House representatives, congressional representatives at the state level, and your senators at the state and federal level, and demand. Don't ask. Demand that the because the Consilience of the evidence be given due consideration for all medical physicians to immediately begin using ivermectin to prevent coronavirus infection or minimize the clinical effects of coronavirus infection. The prophylactic use against the worst case, the worst case scenario. We have to take control of the situation. The regulators are under. They're 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 they're, they're captured. The FDA is captured. The NIH is captured. The CDC is captured. There's no way around it. We have to take this through legislation. We have to do it now. We need House resolutions in all 50 states. We need action right now at the federal level to say. Yeah, the election's important and everything else, but how many thousands of people die every day because they're not getting the medicine that all of the data show? Share this video. We're going to put it out on 24 different media channels. Share this video and keep sharing it. And if you're on Facebook in particular, share it to all of your Facebook groups. If you take 10 minutes right now and take this and share it to all the groups that you're a member of, you're going to be doing a good thing. So this is it's the, the weekend right now that this is airing. Take today, take tomorrow, put a phone call and email together to your representatives and bring their attention to the data that Dr. Corey has put put out. Now watch this channel because when he published when that when that hits, when his paper hits, then we're gonna spread this to all you guys throughout the comments in this channel and every other channel that we have. So Dr. Corey, I, I have to say, as as a human being, 
as an American citizen, as a parent of, of two boys who are deathly afraid of COVID-19 for, 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 for reasons being that they, they love their mom, they love their dad, just out of pure love. They're made deathly afraid by the media. What, what, what can we do to help you? How, what's the best way that we can help sure. you right now? Let me just say that what you just asked, the pe we're trying to work through the people. The, the normal channels of change in medicine is just is failing. You, you use the word captured. I want to add two things to your message. One, I'm trying to be fair here to those governmental agencies. So this emergency use authorization, they've gotten almost everything wrong. Almost everything that's gotten at EUA has failed therapeutically. And so I understand their extreme caution now about making yet another mistake. Monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies just don't work. Convalescent plasma doesn't work. Hydroxychloroquine didn't work. And remdesivir, that's a topic for another time. That is a fake drug, in my opinion, especially in the hospital. Now, because of those, there might be an extreme reluctance to not repeat. But that conservatism, they, you need to do this by case by case. You can't not recommend this based on the last four mistakes. Look at the evidence uniquely. And like you pointed out, the second thing is, our message on the FLCCC is now starting to change. Our old message was look at the data, follow the science. You know what our new message is, James? It's get ready. Your public health leaders, your states need to start preparing to in order to manufacture and have available enough ivermectin for the population. They need to start moving to prepare. The recommendation for its use will come. It will not come as soon as I think it should come, but it's coming and we're warning people, get ready. All right, that, that's, a, that's a great message. So tell them to get ready, it's coming. The science is, is overwhelmingly in support of its use. People go to www.flccc.net and uh, give Dr. Pierre Corey and his uh, colleagues some love there. Um, I've invited them to come back on Unbreaking Science as often as possible, of course. So what we'd like to do is put an advertisement uh, everywhere that I have in my peer-reviewed journal, on my blog. We're going to advertise flccc.net with the message that these are the, med the, the medical profession is undergoing a schism. And I know locally here in Allegheny County there is a major, major schism right now caused by the rush to vaccine, the, 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 the lack of rigorous science in support of the vaccine. I'm sorry to say it, but it's there. There are serious problems with the efficacy rates that were reported. They removed people from the study who got COVID-19 after the first dose, yada, yada, yada. We're going to go over those details. The point is, there's a schism in medicine right now, and the good guys need to win. The good guys being the ones that say, hey, we don't just vaccinate towards health. There are other ways to maintain health. Immune enhancement really means giving your immune system a boost. These are antiviral drugs. These, the antiviral mechanism is known. So Dr. Pierre Corey, I want to thank you. We'll make this video available everywhere as soon as possible. Um, thank you from the bottom of our hearts here at Unbreaking Science at WWDNYK. It's really good to talk to you and good to know Thanks, you. Thanks, James. It's a pleasure meeting you and, and um, you seem like a, a comrade in arms for sure. Absolutely. And if you enjoy Unbreaking Science and the other podcasts that we do at WWDNYK, show some love at patreon.com forward slash WWDNYK. We have Talk Nerdy to Me. We've got Uncanny Valley coming with Gar Stein. Uh, we're going to educate and infotate and whatever it is that they call it these days. Uh, thank you, Dr. Corey. Uh, we'll have you back real soon. Excellent. Thank you.